Good evening, everyone. Great to see all of you here tonight. I know there's many other people uh, joining us online tonight, so welcome to all of you as well. My name is Tom Fleischner. It's uh, my pleasure and honor to, to introduce uh, things tonight. I was the founding director of the Natural History Institute, and it's great to be back here and seeing the wonderful way it's being run by Bob Ellis, Jenny Tetone, and other staff members here. So um, thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, just a couple quick things um, before I introduce the speaker. Um, uh, there's three upcoming programs we wanted to highlight tonight. Um, the first of which is a spring walk in the Sonoran Desert. There's actually flyers about these out in the lobby there. Um, that's going to be led by Liz Makings, a wonderful uh, botanist from Arizona State University. Um, and that is on March 19th. So if you're interested in signing up for any of these, you can talk either to Bob or to Jenny um, after the program. There's limited space in all of these. Um, next, on March 26th, there's a, an artist, uh, a workshop for artists, artwork ideas and how to create them. That's led by Neil Galloway, who's one of the artists in the wonderful Parched exhibit that's in the gallery right here. If you have not yet seen that, highly encourage you to do that before the, the, the show leaves. It's a, a wonderful collaborative exhibit. And last but not least, um, wanted to highlight the uh, trip we have on the San Juan River um, in uh, early May. Uh, that trip will be led by uh, wonderful geologist Lon Abbott and some other ne'er-do-well. Uh, it's actually me. Um, <laughs> and um, it's a wonderful trip. We're really excited to be able to do it again. And uh, um, so, again, if you're interested in that, there's only a few spots left. Um, so, that said, um, it's my, uh, I'm so happy to be able to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Gary Paul Nabhan. Gary is a longtime friend of the Natural History Institute and, and lucky for me, a longtime friend of myself. Our friendship spans well more than probably close to 35 years or so now, and it's always uh, just wonderful to have him here. So Gary is an ethnobotanist, an ecologist, a poet, and a weaver of stories of that connect human cultures, plural, I might say, cultures, and nature in many, many different ways. Um, he is, uh, it kind of blows my mind sometimes, he's the author of well over 30 books, two of which he'll be talking about here tonight. Um, he is the recipient of numerous awards, uh, including a MacArthur Fellowship, uh, John Burroughs Medal for Outstanding Nature Writing, and many, many others. Um, he's also, more recently, uh, has become an ecumenical Franciscan brother um, he is, um, and over the years, Gary has played key roles in many different important organizations here in the Southwest, including, but not limited to, uh, co-founding Native Seed Search, a wonderful organization. Um, uh, the Desert Botanical Garden, the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum, was the founding director of the Center for Sustainable Environments at Northern Arizona University. But for the past number of years, he's been at the University of Arizona, where he, and I have to look at my notes for the, his job title, it's long, um, is the Kellogg Endowed Chair in Southwestern Food and Water Security at the Southwest Center at the U of A. Um, and I just wanted to say, kind of from a personal note, that um, what I see, you know, nat we naturalists, we're always talking about field marks of like identifying characteristics of things. And when I think of Gary's work in the world, uh, three things popped to mind as field marks of his work. One is just simple brilliance and, and insight um, that, is, that continues to, to, to uh, um, just impress me and startle me across the years. One is creativity. Um, he, Gary is consistently across the years putting ideas and people together in new ways, sort of approaching old problems in new ways and coming up uh, with solutions and, and, and building new bonds between uh, different um, uh, groups of people who might not otherwise be thinking of connecting with each other. And, um, and finally, um, the third field mark I would mention is generosity. Gary has a generosity of spirit that 
is has been remarkable to watch over the years. So often, um, deflecting the spotlight, which has often been cast on him to all sorts of other uh, deserving people and organizations again, and and using his influence and his positions to to build up many, many, many other people and and much other good work. So. Um, you know, I'm, I'm one of many, many people who um, is deeply appreciative of that. Tonight, Gary is going to be talking, as I said, about two different books, um, uh, The Nature of Desert Nature and uh, Jesus for Farmers and Fishers. And I want to mention also that our good friends from the Peregrine Book Company are here. So if you're inclined to pick up either one of the books, you can do so right after the talk. And with that, I will turn it over. Please help me in welcoming Gary Nabhan. Okay. Yeah. Well, greetings, Earthlings. And uh, thank you, Tom, for that great introduction. And even more than that, for the great conversations we've had the last day. Uh, We've only seen each other once in the last year, and it's just been great to spend uh, time catching up and not just uh, renewing our friendship, but uh, talking about all the other people we love, including some in this room, that just uh, keep our, uh, our energy being re-inspired and uh, giving us something to wake up in the morning for. And I, I just want to say I have deep affection not only for Tom, but for this whole institute in this town. I only lived here for about two and a half years when I was very clearly wet behind the ears. And Prescott was just so gracious to me. I was laughing to myself today that um, so, some people saw me on the Granite Mountain Trail hiking twice and said, do you like to hike when I was, I think, eight, 18? Sure I do. Well, we're looking for a young person to be on the local Sierra Club board with us. And I said, what's a Sierra Club? <laughs> <laughs> they said, people that hike like you do. <laughs> and I said, and they care about other things too. And so I thought it was funny, these people at the god awful ages of like 65 and 70 asking, a, 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 whatever I was, an 18 or 19 year old kid to be on a board with them. And then as I've reached the last 10 years, I realized how much people of my age now love seeing youth involved in organizations who are on fire about the same topics. And it makes perfect sense to me now. I just thought, how did this happen to me? But the, the point is that generosity is here in this community and it has been all along. And I'm so grateful that you use that word, not because you used it about me, but because I think that's why I love coming back to this community. So thank you all and thank uh, Peregrine Books and my old friend Ty, uh, who's been key to helping this institution get launched too. Um, I wanna say what I'm trying to do tonight is crosswalking two books without going into detail about both, because I don't wanna spoil you know, the tragic ending that will make you cry in both books for you. So I'm going to sort of crosswalk some of their common themes. And for those of you who've known me for the while, a while, you're saying, what the heck is he writing a book about? Uh, Jesus, where did that come from? And um, the, because probably the only time they ever heard me say Jesus when I was younger was when I'd hit my hand on a, uh, with a hammer. Uh, when I was trying to uh, knock in a nail into a board. But it's, um, I'm, I'm of Arab descent. I, I regularly go back to the Middle East, sometimes on peace, reconciliation efforts between um, Israelis and Palestinians and Lebanese and Syrians. My family's both in Lebanon and Syria. And so I've been deeply touched by seeing the deserts there, both in Lebanon and Syria and, and Israel, and reflecting on um, the parables of Jesus about the deserts, about farming and fishing, and how 
their messages echo into our present age. And so at one point, just so being so enthralled by the parallels and differences between the deserts there and the deserts here. I've also spent time in the empty quarter in Saudi Arabia and across the Sahara. I just thought it's time to really take an ecological eye to the, the parables of Jesus, some of which really echo older parables in the Jewish tradition and reflect upon what they mean today in terms of how we care for the land and the water. So that's a lot of what that book is about, sort of what one of my teachers calls um, agroecological hermeneutics. I, told, I to told my editor that and they said, let's not put that on the book, please. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it sounds like a, another viral disease. Anyway, the, the, <laughs> the point is, at some point I just figured, well, heck, if, if artists of all kinds like musicians like Patty Griffin and Bob Dylan and, and uh, Mavis Staples and Aaron Neville get to do one gospel album over their, their career. Maybe I can do a gospel book that's in, in line with my values and sensibilities. So that's my attempt. I don't know if you'll ever see anything else like that from me, but it was really enjoyable. The other one is a book that Tom and other uh, former Prescott uh, friends are in uh, The Nature of Desert Nature is an anthology of how time in the desert has affected the identities of many writers, artists, and musicians who live in Arizona, New Mexico, California, and Northern Mexico, and reciprocally how them spending deep time in the desert has changed their views of desert, the desert, what a desert is. So how the desert has changed our human identity and vice versa, how um, our preconceptions about a, what, what a desert is gets changed through time. And uh, a lot of it'll be, uh, what I'll be talking about is that final theme um, why we need to get what deserts are right at this point in human history because we're entering a braced new world that some of my friends are now calling planet desert that uh, uh, as much as three-fifths of the United States will be in semi-arid and, semi and arid climates. Uh, the uh, USDA map of... Uh, climate zones keeps on shifting. It used to shift every 40 years. Now it switched to every decade. They make a new map because the, the climate patterns for agriculture have changed so much and now they're changing it every five years. And so we're really entering a new phase where much of the United States and already most of Mexico is hot and dry and beyond the threshold of many of the crops that have been grown there and even some of the wild plants. So we'll talk a lot about that too. So let me get started with making some good mischief, which I, I love this audience because many of you are mischief makers. Um, and say that I'll be crosswalking really three things. Um, the, the Sonoran Desert represented by the saguaro, the uh, uh, middle picture, even those are prickly pear, they show up in every biblical a movie I've ever seen, so I keep on wondering, did prickly pears really come from the New World, or were what the, is that what the original parchment paper in the, for the Bible was made on? But that's uh, my uh, hidden Arab identity behind uh, a desert plant. And then the third is what I call the desert within, the sort of spiritual dimensions of the contemplative uh, tradition of the desert mothers and fathers uh, that began in the Middle East and then has spread to all parts of the world. And some of you are well aware of that and that may be a new concept to others of you. So let's get started. Um, so what do these uh, two books uh, have in common? Uh, what does a desert have to do with them, and with who we are and how we live? And both books touch on that. Uh, there's 25 different voices in the anthology, including Tom, so it's really 
to show that the desert is not just one thing, but cultural constructs and, and images from many, many cultures around the world. And yet, those of us who live in or near American deserts have the echoes of images, stereotypes, and ideologies that emerged out of the deserts uh, around the Mediterranean in both North Africa and the Middle East that um, as the old world or the, the paleotropic world influenced the new world and the neotropics, we carried those images with us, not just because of biblical literature, but really all of Western literature from the Greeks and Romans had clear stereotypic images of the desert that may have emerged in one language, but spread to many. The old world, the term for desert in Greek and Roman, Hebrew, and, and even many other languages, all the, of the Semitic languages, um, um, is related to desolate, deserted, degraded, diminished, and Deserts happen to be the only place on the planet as landscapes that we define by what they lack, not what they have. And that's really telling that, that we try to remake deserts into something else because we feel they are lacking in something essential, water for one thing, but many things actually. And that even in biblical words, let's um, knock down the mountains and narrow the path. You can't do that in many <laughs> desert areas because it's rough terrain. So there's, there's instincts going way, way back in, in Greek, uh, Roman, and Hebrew uh, thought of remaking the deserts into something that clearly they're not. And, and um, that has implications for how we still deal with deserts here in the Sun Belt, which keep in mind uh, since World War II, the Sun Belt from Central Texas to San Diego and LA is the harbor for the largest human migration in history in a matter of 50 years, from 48 to 98. More people moved in to the deserts of North America than people have moved into any landscape in a similar amount of time. So most of us are rank beginners, newcomers in understanding deserts. And we either love them or we fear them. And sometimes it's a mix of both. But there was a counter movement very early on. You can see it in beautiful writing in the Old Testament, the Song of Songs and the Psalms of the deserts of being a place of wisdom where the prophets go for their vision quests, um, a place of fragrance and brilliance, and that, that it was a luminous landscape. It's, that's reflected in most 19th and 20th century naturalists who came to the New World deserts. But it's a really strong instinct that a counterculture in each desert um, saw its value and tried to express that to the larger public, sometime to deaf ears, sometime to a bit of a larger population. The key moment for me in that history is when the desert hermits flocked to the desert of the Seti in Egypt that I've spent time in uh, three or four times uh, in travels and studies, one of an oasis on, uh, in the midst of the Sahara. Um, uh, uh, but I've also spent time uh, in the desert of the Sadi at Wadi al Natran that I'll talk about. And these people were responding deeply contemplative um, uh, people of. Uh, of early Christianity that lived lives of poverty in communes and were anti-materialistic in the sense that they were overwhelmed, and this is the story in, in uh, Jesus for Farmers and Fishers, uh, by the oppression and the 
usurpment of land and water by the Greco-Roman Empire um, that uh, put most of the Hebrews, Samaritans, um, and um, Nabataeans in what is now Israel and Jordan in debt and servitude. And they saw whatever Christianity was at the time as a way out of that oppression and resistance to the Greco-Roman Empire. And then by the fourth century, they realized that the Roman Empire was doing a hostile takeover of Christianity. Uh, uh, that the, that uh, uh, the, the emperors wanted to become Christians not only for their own spiritual well-being, but to, to gain control of the marginalized people who were, who were against what the empire was doing both to people and the land. And so tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of women and men uh, descended out of Greek, Turkey, Italy, of course those entities weren't what we called them then, uh, to move into the deserts of uh, Syria, present day Saudi Arabia, uh, Jordan, Israel, and uh, Palestine and Egypt, again, all newer geopolitical definitions. But they, they went either to be hermits there following St. Anthony or uh, into caves and, and uh, remote places, or they lived in communal settings where they disavowed material wealth, took vows of poverty, meditated out in the desert for uh, six days a week and only came together one day a week to share the Sabbath with, with their colleagues. And beautiful, beautiful writing came out of that period that I first knew when I was a student here at, at Prescott in, <clears throat> uh, boy, exactly 50 years ago, where one of the first books I bought when I uh, got here, I think from the bookworm in Sedona when it was over there, was uh, Wisdom of the Desert, Thomas Merton's collection of, of um, I wouldn't call them proverbs, I'd call them more like Zen koans <laughs> from uh, the desert uh, fathers. Now there's larger volumes of thousands of these aphorisms and, and short koan-like riddles from both desert mothers and fathers and wonderful scholarship including a great book by a neighbor of mine, uh, uh, Douglas Burton Christie, called Blue Sapphire of the Mind that crosswalks the wisdom of the Desert Fathers with what 19th and 20th century naturalists here in the American West uh, wrote about and seeing common themes with them. So this was a movement of resistance, of rejection of the empire, the globalization of the known world at that time. It was really the first wave of globalization, even though it didn't reach to the Americas. It was everything that the Eurasian, African uh, cultures knew and, and, and was a devastating time in terms of the oppression and, and, and degradation of, of people and the land. Curiously, about the time the back to the land hippie movement happened in the United States and Canada, um, Egyptians, as well as other people in the Middle East and Southern Europe, rebuilt the monasteries of the fourth century into stunning oases. They were based on artesian springs. They didn't pump water. They just used the water that welled up out of the ground to grow food in about eight monasteries that form an archipelago in the desert of the Seti uh, with sand dunes just on the horizon every place, but this is a, almost a place like the Salton Sea and started this contemplative tradition using the old writings to begin anew. And it's just a stunning thing because in addition to spending a lot of time in solitude, they not only grow all their food, but take orphans in from all over Egypt, teach them how to farm, and export their food surplus to orphans throughout 
Egypt, uh, all the way up to uh, all the way up the Nile, um, uh, to Aswan and all that area, and so they it's become the major breadbasket, but with foods completely adapted to the desert, including dates. It gets hotter there than it does in Phoenix. So they're, they're really consummate desert farmers, and I've learned a lot from them, and they're wonderful, wonderful, warm, funny people, too. But if you think I'm trying to sell Christianity in some way, I'm not. This desert contemplative tradition also either independently developed or spread through uh, cultural exchanges between multiple faiths. I've been in Central Asia on the edge of the Taklamakan and Gobi Desert into places where along rivers, it looked like the San Juan actually, back in the caves, there's Zoroastrian, uh, tantric Buddhic, Buddhist traditions from Tibet uh, monasteries, Christian, early Christian monasteries and uh, Taoist monasteries, all sharing the same sensibility that I'm talking about in, in the desert of the Seti where we first gained the word asceticism. So here's monks of four or five different cultures and faiths interchanging things in desert canyons, taking canoes across uh, uh, the river, it really looks more like Glen Canyon than, the, than uh, the San Juan, and visiting on their off days, Sabbath days, these contemplatives of these other faiths. It's just an amazing, amazing convergence and happened for about three years from the, uh, three centuries from the fourth to seven centuries AD. And so in no means, in no way do I want to restrict this desert contemplative tradition to Christianity or Judeo-Christian face alone. They wrote about the desert in a way that I think reminds us of the elegance and austerity of deserts. Um, I'm going to go on to the next slide, I think, because, um, well, I'll go back to this. That, that in them, it wasn't deprivation that they were after by taking vows of poverty and silence. But what Aldous Huxley said, that I think I mentioned in another slide, it's, it's like taking a valve and turning it so you're cutting out all the distractions, the spray of water out over all of you, so that you can follow one trickle, one thread of water without the distractions. And, and I think Huxley's metaphor is brilliant because that's what contemplative practice is really about. We live in a world of distractions, not just social media and TV and radio, but the crap we keep in our head. I mean, this 95% of what goes through our head each day from the time we wake up is just completely inane shit. Like, oh, my toe's hurting. Did I step on a mesquite thorn today or did I bump into something in the middle of the night? And will people notice that I'm walking with a limp today? Should I try to do something about that? Or, wow, look at that person. Not thinking anything but, wow, look at that person. And then, you know, wow, look at that car. So we're just filled with distraction. And these guys basically said, let's go to a place with fewer distractions so we can concentrate on really what matters. And so they tightened the valve down at some times. And then for their visions, they spread it wide open. And some of their ecstatic visions from this time sound like psilocybin hallucinations or ayahuasca hallucinations, but we have no evidence directly that they were using hallucinogens. They may have been using frankincense and myrrh to get them into some kind of heavenly mood, but it was really coming from the desert itself. So when old world cultures from Africa as well as Europe, we now know that a lot of people who came to the New World through Latin America were, were crypto-Jews and crypto-Muslims that were escaping the Inquisition. 
they carried a lot of those old world desert sensibilities of both things with them. And yet they had a hard time initially recognizing that there were parallel traditions in, the de in indigenous cultures of the desert, including the kinds of vision quests that I've done with the Cone Cocker Sierra Indians, where they, they, at one point they said, they're talking about some of their, the reasons their medicine plants work with me, and I said, yeah, but is that like the, the physical effects of the plan, or is that something psychosomatic? I had to use another word for them to get that. And they looked at me like, you've been visiting us for 25 years. Have we ever initiated you? That is, you're just talking BS. You don't even get what our culture is about. And I said, well, I can't be initiated. I'm not one of your culture. And they said, look, how are you going to put up with you if you've known us for 25 years and we really trust you in other ways, but we don't initiate you? You're sometimes acting like a 14-year-old. Get an elder to take you out to a cave and get it done, or you're not going to understand anything about our culture. So they had me fast for four days, and then they put me up in this cave. So there were parallel traditions in the New World, is all I was saying, of deep desert contemplative practice. And yet, it took a hell of a long time for us to recognize that. But there have been people all along who came to these deserts in North America who saw them not as a wasteland, but a place of abundance. And I just want to remind you that of all the deserts in the world, <laughs> the Sonoran Desert is probably the least barren, uh, most diverse, structurally diverse for sure. Look at agaves, uh, columnar cacti, all kind of understory wildflowers. And it's not only good to think about, it's good to eat. That's also a food forest, even though permaculture people think food forest is either tropical or temperate trees, that's the real food forest uh, of, of, of the Americas. These incredibly diverse life forms growing in harmony with one another, partitioning uh, meager resources and using less water per pound of food over a decadal scale than any cultivated crop that humans grow. So we have had people who figure that out, that there's abundance, hidden abundance here. You have to know how to treat it, prepare it, care for it, or it'll go away, like our teeth go away if we don't, if we neglect them. But it's here. This is hidden abundance, not um, that our deserts lack something. So that's a little bit about the impetus behind the nature of desert nature. I was in deep contemplation about this. And I said, if I tried to tell this story by myself as a one-off kind of thing, it wouldn't work. Why don't I bring together a chorus of 25 voices from all the different cultures in the desert, Yaquis, Siri, Tohono O'odham, Akimoro O'odham, uh, uh, Chicano, uh, uh, Mexican citizens who, like Homero Regis, a poet laureate of Mexico, who spent years in the deserts of North America, and have them talk about this abundance. And some of the essays are just so heartbreakingly beautiful, uh, one by, uh, who I think is a, the greatest new writer in the West period, Paco Cantu, who I know many of you are fond of. But the essays in the book are just stunning reflections on all that a desert can be. And it's not that everyone agrees or takes the same tack, but it shows the abundance of value hidden in the desert that are at reach just beyond our doorsteps. So, you know, it's, it's an odd thing that we talk about the imagery of the desert, but I'm less and less inclined that we can understand the deserts only through visual imagery. Um, the, the contemplative cultures in those oases all had these fragrance gardens that they designed the plant composition for the desert's fragrances because the fragrances of things like frankincense and myrrh were literally the connective tissue between humans and their creator. 
and the, even the gardens of the, of the Morisco uh, garden architects in Andalusia, Granada, and Cordova were all fragrance gardens. That that was the way that we communicated with uh, creation and creation communicated with us. So my, my last two years of technical research is looking at desert fragrances here as a lexicon of communication between plant and plant, plant and pollinator, plant and herbivore, and plant and people. And like the many great people that are working on the underworld beneath us in the desert or the temperate forest, and Michael Risey is as a, a wood-wide web that connects all trees and shrubs, I'm looking at the lexicon of communication that plants emit either through their leaves or through their floral fragrances. So I'm not gonna read little bits of it, but you can do that later on that really speak to the multi-sensory ways that the desert communicates to us. But in general, many of those cultures sensed that there was something um, powerful spiritually about how water moved through desert and carried fragrances, life, microbes, uh, all living things through the desert, but they went beyond thinking of water as merely useful, but something that delights and spiritually refreshes us, even when it's scarce, perhaps because it's scarce. And so water was considered sacred. Next week, I'm down at the Sonoran Desert Forum, and we're talking about special designations for the Quito Bikito Springs that have been nearly killed by the, the wall construction and its pumping of groundwater that nearly dried up the springs there and how to bring them back. But it reminds us, every desert culture, there, there was a whole set of protected areas throughout the Middle East called Hamas that were only for artesian springs in the wetlands they created as the last places you wanted to screw up. Those were to hold back for future generations, that commodifying that, overusing it was the worst thing that you could possibly do. And as some of you know from the work that Gary's done on the Verde, we've dried up about 80% of the springs in the uh, Verde Valley over the last 50 years. And those artesian springs aren't something that we can easily bring back. And the recharge that it takes to get a depleted artesian spring flowing is one of the hardest things to flip. And so perhaps Arizona should zone every artesian spring system, St. David, Arizona, the Verde ones, the ones in the Grand Canyon, as inviolate. So here's the Huxley one I was looking at. A world uncluttered, that's why I go to a place like the Pinacati for, for walking meditation, that you're free of so many distractions, but even the sparseness of the vegetation is allowed to speak to you because you can focus on your interactions with an elephant tree or a Sunita cactus or other things. So these desert contemplatives, both in the old world and new world, sought to redefine their own lives and the roles uh, uh, they had as caretakers on earth by seeking refuge and sanctuary in remote places. Their Sabbath gesture was to go out into a desert cave, a desert mountaintop, or, or even a desert riparian area uh, and, and just get away from the human world by embracing the other than human world. And, and I have to say that, um, that those places, not just international parks and biosphere reserves in Mexico, but even the tiniest little spring or seep have significance well beyond their area. Uh, most of them are really biologically diverse 
for instance, there's more plants and animals associated with Quito Bequito Springs on about 40 acres than the rest of Oregon Pipe all, all combined. And so they're of disproportionate importance for the conservation of biological diversity, but also, I think, because of cultural traditions. 4,500 years of human prayer and contemplation detailed by archaeologists at Quito Bequito and the border, border wall nearly snuffed that out. So what we find all in deserts all over the place is um, biocultural landscapes, most of them not buildings that echo the desert itself, but things like springs and, and mountaintops. We actually have more <clears throat> time uh, noted in the Gospels of Jesus being up praying in mountains, in caves, or in, around springs and riparian zones than we have them talking to people. Um, and, and we need to flip that, that the story that most of us carry in our heads about early Christianity, it was mostly a contemplative practice in remote places. That's the roots of Christianity, not the Vatican. But there's not just the spaces, the places themselves, but the pilgrimage routes to get to them. And that was a tragic thing about the wall construction for me. The salt pilgrimage places that were not only for salt, but for dreams and songs from the autumn people and also the Mimbris people going hundreds of miles down to the Gulf of California for ocean power. They weren't allowed to go in the water, but they fell asleep on the shores to gather dreams and songs to carry back to their people, gather salt, it was the primary spiritual practice of desert peoples in this region, even from right here in Yavapai County. And the wall blocked those thousand-year-old pilgrimage routes. So the pilgrims I know, when they arrived at Quito Piquito, had to run 12 miles along a dirt road back east to go through the port of entry to get to the other side and then continue down for another 70 miles. When you've already run 150 miles with a, a cross or a stone in your mouth, you've been celibate for three or four weeks before you even go on it. It's a deep spiritual journey and it was disrupted by the environmental noise of the border. Now they put two big gates in with locks and asked the pilgrims to call ahead so that the gates in the wall can be open to them so that they can pass through and then they're immediately locked again. And uh, the pilgrims I know of the autumn tradition think that even allowing a gate to be there is a sacrilege. I have to say that one of the great things about the um, Nature of Desert Nature book is that it's illustrated by murals from a popula the populist movement among Native Americans and Chicanos to do their social action through mural painting in every town in the Southwest. And I just love this one for its absolute wildness. That's pilgrims but the pilgrims include animals as well as people. The first story that we have from the Sonoran Desert, believe it or not, is Spanish slave traders coming up from Guadalajara with Guzman, the, the horrific guy that was even worse than Cortez. They get to the southern edge of the Sonoran Desert, uh, uh, near between the Rio Yaqui and the Rio Fuerte, and they're met by a line of Yaqui women, children, old men, medicine men, hummingbirds, deer, monarch butterflies, and bats. And an old man went out in front of them and said, welcome to our land. I'm drawing a line in the sand. And if you despoil anything north of here, um, You'll never see the end of it. And the Yaqui have remained undefeated ever since then. That's the first story we have recorded in oral tradition and Spanish documents 
uh, the first encounter between Europeans and the indigenous people in the Sonoran Desert of saying, don't cross this line if you're going to despoil the sanctity of this place. And then you get stuff like this from my friend Mike Chiago, um, who uh, has just finished a book with Amadeo Rea, who used to uh, teach at Prescott on the Piman creation story. And in his mind, the desert is a place of abundance and activity and engagement. Yes, there are more barren places with the creosote bush in between these hillsides full of edible and medicinal plants. And his, his vision that's 50 pages in this book that U of A Press will come out with in the, the fall is just beyond belief about how rich the desert is in the autumn tradition. The word Tahano for Tahano Autumn means a, a luminous place. That's their name for the desert. When you wake up in the morning, you see the backlit saguaro spines just glowing in the air and the, the brittle bush just shining luminous in every direction. That's what they called the desert, not something that was lacking. And yet, why we need to get this right, what a desert is, is because we're vastly changing the rest of the world to be hotter and drier, and the word that people are using for that is desertification, which I think is an incredibly crappy word. <laughs> They're not making a saguaro ironwood forest out of grasslands or steppes or, or, or scrublands. They're making something that doesn't have that integrity. So the word desertification is always bug the crap out of me. I think it's one of those words that we should throw out like we did denigration. You know, all the racist implications embedded in that world, denigration. I feel the same thing that structural racism towards deserts in the word desertification. But this is what we're doing. We're turning the whole planet hotter and drier faster than we can even document the changes in it. And so our our whole planet is getting luminous in another way, like radioactive. And we're at ground zero in that, friends, uh, to the south of you 100 miles in Pinell County in southern Mariposa County, when the tap got turned off of Colorado River that everyone warned our governor about for years, uh, in September, the farmers in southern Maricopa and Pinell County lost one-third of all their water from the Colorado River, resulting in an immediate loss of $100 million of farm gate income and the loss of 500 jobs with the tip of a baton. And the worst is yet to come. And so one of the 10 richest agricultural counties in terms of farm gate sales in the United States is now going to become a place of abandoned fields, not with saguaros and mesquites, but with tumbleweeds and saltbush. And so what will the desert down there look and taste like? It's where you should be considered Arizona's breadbasket because it's a place where durum wheat is grown. What is it going to be in the future? And what it's going to be in the future depends how we envision what a desert can be, whether it's a place of impoverishment or a place that's restorable to a condition of resilience that can deal with the uncertainty that we're inevitably going to meet. And I don't think to have that resilience, we can use the definition of the deserts that most Arizonans carry in their heads. So perhaps it's time that we sit under the Bodhi tree of the Sonoran Desert, the saguaro that my friends in the Tohono O'odham Reservation have recently granted sacred personhood to legally through a resolution that says that they will prosecute anyone who damages or kills a saguaro, not only on their reservation, but in their historic homelands. And it was unanimously passed by every district on the Tahanoa Atom Reservation and unanimously passed by their tribal council. And they will not let 10,000 saguaros be mutilated and massacred like the ones that they saw at Oregon Pipe 
Cactus National Monument in the last two years. I walked up to the border wall with the woman from the Tohono O'odham Nation who had not seen the wall yet, and she saw inside at least a thousand mutilated cacti, and she felt her knees crying, and she said just one sentence. Don't they know that these are people? Don't they know that these are people? Thank you. Preguntas? Yeah. Um, I, I, um, the, the animals are what I'm talking about in, in Ajo next week at the Sonoran Desert Forum, the, the border wall year and a half of construction, um, force the at least temporary disappearance of 45 species of birds that had been known in the three years previous to wall construction but 12 other bird species that didn't know how to swim but loved mud flats came in when the pond at Quito Paquito shrank to about the size of this room. And so the animal impact was even more immediate. It, it, a bunch of cottonwoods and willows died to the overpumping, but the, the wildlife um, along most desert rivers and most desert oases historically was unbelievable. And George Webb, a Piman elder, talked about the, the um, Salt River uh, before the Coolidge Dam was put up that dewatered the whole Gila River Reservation. And he said, um, the word desert doesn't have anything to do with what we had here, it was paradise. And by that man, he meant such a place of abundance for wildlife. The, the places along the Santa Cruz down where I live near between Patagonia and Tucson had uh, black bear, grizzly bear, and, and Mexican wolves down in the riparian corridor for a good part of the year. And they went, only went up into the mountains for three months or so. The, the, the life to be had was by those rivers. So we've lost a lot of that, but we're also working in Patagonia with borderlands restoration to rewater the headwaters of the Santa Cruz and hopefully uh, the techniques we use there can be used to rewater the other rivers in Arizona. Thank you for that great question. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, thanks Lisa for being here. Yeah, you, you know. They're all dying. Does restoration mean the classic thing where we move, actually move plants to facilitate, or are you thinking of just more on yeah. I, I see restoring it not as going back in time, like, like you know, the old trope about pre Indian or, or pre white man. Restoring it back to what it looked like before the white men as if there was no active or passive management by indigenous peoples. But even if we went back before indigenous peoples, we're, we're not gonna capture that. The, the prevailing climatic and even edaphic conditions have changed radically. I and mean, that's what we were talking about, that, that places are now salted up soils that weren't before the last hundred years. So when I talk about restoring, I, I mean telling a new story for what is possible on that land, giving the, the landscape trends and climate trends that we see. And there's a lot of uncertainty there. It's not just hotter and drier, as you know. Some places are gonna get wetter. We had five years of rain in Patagonia, two years ago, drought until July 10th, and then we had 25 inches before September. Fifth, five times the, the rainfall of 
2020 in a month and a half of 2021. So it's the uncertainty that makes predicting how to do restoration the toughest. And so I think we, we really have to broaden our sense of restoration that we're on, we're, we're trying to, to divine like a water witcher the trajectory of, of where the landscape is going and all the stuff that you know about assisted migration of animals and even plants to save endemics is gonna have to happen in some way, but we have to do that carefully. We just can't say, oh, let's drive them up 150 miles and plop them down in something that has a couple of the same plants. It's not gonna be that simple. You know, it's why a lot of zoos have failed to be good conservation things, because they just put a few postage stamp components of a habitat in and say, okay, they should work out here, and they don't. You know, so we really have to see Restoration is one of the most humbling and complex um, human endeavors that we can engage in, but it puts us back in touch with reading the landscape, something that this institute was formed to teach people how to do in a really dynamic way. And so that our assumptions are broken apart by what we're seeing over time. The, the longitudinal studies of the kind that you've done over the years uh, in the Colorado Plateau are key to that because we know there's been change for multiple reasons, grazing, uh, uh, dewatering of rivers and streams, um, uh, off-road vehicles, a million different things, fire regime changes. So, so re restoring doesn't mean that we go back to an older story, but but we engage as participants in something that we don't know where it's going to end up yet. And, and, and so I, I think for as much as, I think it's something like 80% of the ecological restoration plots fail in the West. Uh, that, I don't know what they're including in that, the seven state Colorado River Basin or what, but there's more failures than successes. We have to keep on trying to get it right because in doing that, we see how dynamic and how many factors are involved in restoration, and it's no simple recipe. It's not Betty Crocker. Thank you. Yeah, Gary. I have a cousin named Hope. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I mean I, I, it's funny that you're asking me that because, you know, I think what you're doing of uh, being a full-time, full-fledged citizen in the Verde Valley watershed is, by example, you're not saying, not just saying you're doing, for, with the last half of your life devoting it to that river system, that's exactly what we have to do. That's what Tom's done for, with most of his life. That's what Doug, Doug's done. And, and, and so I, I think what, what gives me hope are there people like you already doing it. Now, how do we get that groundswell? You know, I, you know when, we, we, when we have a, you know, a state legislature that I was afraid when I came up to Prescott that maybe you know, they'd outlawed rain up here or something, you know, because it's, it's communist. All those rain raindrops, uh, you know, aren't very good capitalists. I, I just thought, like, whoa, um, you know, how do we, given the divides in our state and our nation, how do we get any of this sung? Build back better as, like, in an eddy in a, in a muddy river trying to get loose again. So I think we're going to see a lot of restoration dollars flow in to government agencies, but the communities have to know what they want out of that. We're just going to make even more of a wreck of the place. My first job after college was uh, working for the um, Army Corps of Engineers. There's all kind of euphemisms for what, what ACE stands for that I won't go into because most of them are vulgar. But 
what they thought was restoration of the Mississippi watershed ended up to be its undoing in ways. It created the big floods uh, like what Aaron Neville sang about on his gospel album. So the, so the whole thing is that, that um, we can't let that be a top-down kind of restoration. It has to be a community-based restoration with feet on the ground, hearts in the dirt, and our hands in the soil to do it. We, it can't be an abstract thing. And so I think we have to mobilize people to be engaged participants in the act of restoration to keep it out of the clouds. And, and you know, how we get that groundswell, we can argue about, but, you know, I feel grateful that I, I know a lot of people in this community that are not only dedicated to that thing, but whether it's making sure that places have their water and that the water spontaneously generates new vegetation or whether you're doing active restoration, that that's happening all over the state. And 25 years ago when I was at Desert Botanical Garden, we started a desert restoration task force and we literally had people who said, oh, you can't restore any desert. I just, you're too brittle. And that's changed. That's changed in, in a quarter century, it's changed. Any other questions or comments? You can disagree with me, you don't have to like me. <laughs> okay, well thank you. Um, I'm happy to talk to you one by one. I'll put my mask back on. Um, and so if you wanna buy books or if you just wanna say something one-on-one -on -one that you don't wanna say in front of a group like this is a S session, we'll, we'll, we'll just talk one-on-one, -on -one. so thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. And just for sure, the, in case I didn't say clearly enough, thanks to Bob and the Institute and thanks to Susan and Peregrine, two of the greatest institutions in Arizona, in fact, in the universe.